are stirring the cauldron. Now, here's your host, Marla Brooks. Hey, Mary Meet everybody, and welcome once again to Stirring the Cauldron here on the Para-X Radio Network. Now, my opening song tonight was called Little Helpers, which is a dark Christmas instrumental by Midnight Syndicate. They've got a wonderful new Christmas album out called Christmas, A Ghostly Gathering, and it's got songs like Dance of the Sugar Plum Fairies, the ghostly version, up on the housetop, the dark version, and many more old favorites, as well as a couple of new ones, including Little Helpers, and one which I really, really like called Krampus. So anyway, let's get busy. Um, My guest tonight is Thomas Hatzis, and he is a historian of witchcraft, magic, Western religions, contemporary psychedelia, anthenogens, and medieval pharmacopoeia. That's a mouthful, all of that. He's also the author of The Witch's Ointment, The Secret History of Psychedelic Magic, and that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Tom, welcome to the show. Hi, Marla. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, you just wanted to be on so you could, like, you know, get me all tongue-tied all night with with family. (laughs) Yeah, but that's okay. okay. It's the holiday season. I can let my guests do what they want. It's all right. Uh, (laughs) And, you know, the next time I need some special ingredients to stir into my cauldron, I'm coming to you. Um, (laughs) I mean, what a great book. It would seem, though, that all of this began in medieval times when hallucinogenic herbs were part of the practice of poison magic, which some people will not be familiar with. Um, And it kind of sounds like a lucrative business to be in back then. So what exactly was poison magic and what was its purpose? Uh, Poison magic is a, a broad term for a variety of uses for these different kinds of psychoactives. Uh, as I'm sure your listeners are no doubt aware, um, during medieval times, the early modern period, there was just a range of magical practices. And what um, drug magic, or in the records it's called uh, wenificia, um, what that uh, that that just it, it's a any time a drug is inserted into a kind of magic. So, for example, uh, bewitchment. Uh, somebody might um, let's say you have an abused housewife. Uh, her husband's a jerk. He's abusing her. Um, she might buy some kind of psychoactive from a wise woman or a medicine man or a sorcerer of some, of some kind, and you know, kind of surreptitiously put it in her uh, husband's food, wait 45 minutes to an hour, then say, you know, like uh, an incantation or something, and uh, he would start feeling the effects, but hearing her repeating these magic words, he would attribute what was happening to her powers. Mm-hmm. And, well, it... it it caused many uh, people to behave. <laughs> to do this, that would be an example of um, poison magic. On the other end of the spectrum, you have entheogenic uses, um, or at least what would appear to to be entheogenic uses. I should say uh, that is more, you know, um, inner vision kind of uh, use, but still under the the uh, the title poison magic. So it's a variety of things. Mm-hmm. And I want to talk about some common witch ointments, but before we get into that, I'm curious about the use of the hallucinogenic herbs throughout history. I mean, probably every culture has used them since the beginning of time for various purposes, and many still do, Um, not just recreationally, but in their religious rites and ceremonies as well, correct? Um, I don't know that all places and times, Mm. uh, but certainly very many. Mm-hmm. It, so much so that it, it it's not uncommon. It's not uncommon in in world history. Yeah, I don't know lot. if it was everywhere, but it was certainly in in enough places that you know what I mean, like a, uncommon. Yeah, and people that I were mean, common. sorry, yeah, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> and sorry. People that were good with plants and and knew. Um, different formulas for for even for analgesia, for example. You know, this plant is good for analgesia and anal- sure. analgesia. I can't even say that. Um, it's going to give me a headache in a minute. Um, <laughs> but um, you know, they're good for that, and they are some. Some of them are hallucinogenic. 
Um, and so it, it's kind of common. And I mean, okay, let's talk about Coca Cola. How about that? Um, well, that cocaine was the main ingredient in Coca Cola at one time. Mm -hmm. And that's common knowledge. Um, they used to sell cocaine and heroin and all stuff like that over the counter yeah, that you could buy. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, Bay Bayer's uh, aspirin actually was, I think, the, the, the people that uh, put heroin on the shelves. But uh, Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no, no. No, that's fine. Um, but, yeah, so, I mean, this is nothing new anywhere. No. Um, <laughs> but in one respect, I mean, which is – way back when, were once considered the wise people, the wise women, primarily they were women, who were the midwives, who were the pharmacists, who were, you know, there for all different kinds of reasons. They knew how to live with nature, with, with the plants, um, and they were revered for it. I mean, really, witches were kind of, you know, cool to know and to have around because they were very helpful. And... Yes. Um, you know, and, and I want to get into flying ointment, which is ointments, and, you know, the most popular being flying. But I, I was watching, and we'll get to that, but I was watching a YouTube that you did talking about the demonizing mm -hmm. of the flying ointment way back when. And, I mean, the demonizing of the witches, um, saying, well, people thought it enabled witches to fly and meet up with the devil and join in a raucous demonic Sabbath. Um, and now, while that might seem like a whole lot of fun to some... <laughs> it seems to, to have taken our well-respected wise women status and turned us primarily into the devil's whores. So I, I'd kind of like to get into that because it went into the Malleus Maleficarum. It went into the burning times. I mean, and, and I, as I mentioned to you earlier, I read something today that you wrote about it, and it was amazing in this, in this um, YouTube video too. So let's talk about how something as simple as herbs got us into really big trouble and we've spent thousands of years trying to live down a bad image. Sure. It, it's a, uh, that, that's a lot. It, it's a very complicated um, kind of process that took place as far as the demonization was concerned. It's not something that happened overnight. It was largely the result of a debate um, about if and how witches uh, could actually fly. And, um, there were some people that argued that um, they they weren't really flying. They were just using these kinds of ointments. Like that was just one of their uh, ways of explaining it. And they're in the earliest records, um, uh, guys like Johann Nitter, Alonzo Tostado, uh, there, there's nothing diabolical about these ointments at all. Mm -hmm. um, this is kind of like the pre-demonization period. It's in the, the 1420s, early 1430s. There, there's nothing there. They're just describing people having these experiences, um, and the devil doesn't play any role in it. Uh, during, I believe, uh, the Council of Basel, which was a, uh, a council that took place between the years 1430 and 1445, uh, so it was a 15-year council, there was a, <laughs> they had a lot to talk about. <laughs> um, uh, they, I, I believe that a lot of the ideas and the debates uh, about uh, the witch's ointment um, and what it actually was took place. Now, not in the grand meeting halls where they discussed very important topics, uh, like um, uh, heretical uprisings, church reform, things like that. Uh, but I think that uh, maybe as kind of side notes, it was discussed because many of the earliest people to write about uh, the ointments were at the Council of Basel. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it can't really at this point be proved either way whether they talked about it or not. Um, anyway, uh, where am I going with this? So this debate... Um, Pretty much the other side won that the this was a using these ointments was what they called a crimen animi, which was a crime of the spirit. It was a way that corrupted you. Um, the uh, most liberal arguments about that said that what it did was it weakened the mind. They weakened the mind enough to let the devil enter, and that was a liberal view of them at mm. the time. Mm -hmm. uh, the the more conservative view was just that, no, these things just are like, they allow you to embody this, this, um, I, I, it's, it's, again, it's really complicated because a lot of it has to do with, uh, 
like just theoretical demonology. <laughs> um, it's it's just it's very difficult to to really pin down um, how the entire thing took place. Uh, there were lots of fears about uh, heretics as well. There, there were just uh, there were fears about what ritual magicians did. Uh, all of these played into the stereotype. Um, but the the idea that the ointment could serve as a way for a witch to fly that was what ultimately had ended up having them demonized. Yeah, it got ugly, In, and I, it, I, sorry as, if that doesn't make any sense at all. No, it does, and you know it it got to the point that. Um, it ended up, as we just said, in the Malleus Maleficarum, um, which was a book, for those who don't know, was a book that was how to identify torture and kill witches, basically. Um, yeah, you know, um, Pope Innocente, which I love that. Pope Innocente IV, he was not innocent. He set up this tribunal, and then, you know, the two guys got into it and wrote a book, and it got ugly. But that led to the burning times. And all of this just kept snowballing after a fact. And like I said, we've not been able to recover completely um, since then because we, that we, they did such a good job. Yeah. Um, you know, you can actually see, uh, to go back to your question that I was uh, tripping over a moment ago, uh, just through example with the Malleus Maleficarum, when they're talking about the witch's ointment, they're talking about it in its you know most diabolical form. They're saying it's made out of children's flesh and that yes. witches are using it to fly to the devil. However, they're... They were familiar with Johann Nitter, the guy who I mentioned earlier that was a skeptic and just said, no, they're not really flying. It's, it's these kinds of these drug ointments that are doing it. They mm -hmm. were familiar with his work and decided to completely write that side out of it. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that, I guess, just in textual form is uh, a good way to view uh, how this was uh, done. The, the um, uh, Knitter was writing in the 1430s. The Malleus uh, was uh, 1484. It was mm -hmm. published. Um, mm -hmm. So you, you, you can actually see it in the texts, the way they, they ignore you know, certain things and kind of invent others. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's really sad that in a sense, I mean, once it got into the Malleus Maleficarum, that was kind of like putting the last nail in the coffin as far as people thinking witches were anything other than helpful and wise, you know? I mean, that really kind of changed it. And in a sense, you can say that the church actually transformed folk medicine practices into sa satanic experiences in a sense, right? Well, it, the, the satanic experience was already there. It was uh, so... What they what they turned these ointments were was an avenue uh, that y you could have this already existing what they considered satanic experience. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's too bad they didn't understand that we never believed in Satan to begin <laughs> with. But you know that was kind of a moot point at at, at that time. Um, all right, so let's get back to the flying ointments. I think that people may think that they actually some people might think as they did back then that. They might have actually given a witch power to fly, but um, not in the physical sense anyway. Um, how were they used? How were the ointments used? Yeah. Um, they were either rubbed on the flesh or um, inserted into a, uh, you know, a cavity downstairs mm -hmm. with uh, fingers, maybe a pessary. And I was also reading that they would slather it on the broom and then straddle the broom and it would be absorbed that way as well. And that was where that they came up with the flying ointment because it had to do with the broom. Um, that's that's more of a modern myth, the the okay. whole broomstick thing. Yeah, that was invented in nineteen seventy three. There there's uh I mean, I would be very, very excited if there were any evidence for that, but um there mm -hmm. just isn't, which is uh, why when you, let's say if you were to Google it, I'm sure it'll come up all over the internet, but they'll never actually cite a source. They'll just say it, um, but there, there actually isn't a source for it. You know, I, how did you get into all of it? I mean, it's a fascinating subject. It's very complex. It is. Um, you didn't just one day say, hmm, I think I'm going to do something about psychedelic witchcraft blah blah where where did that come from in you 
Let's see. Um, I had been interested in just the uh, the history of, of psychedelics so far as I knew it when I was in my undergrad years, which was, you know, the, the 1960s. Mm-hmm. Um, that was, you know, growing up, that's all I really knew about it. Um, when I, uh, when I started investigating the Witches Oyman was about eight or nine years ago, um, I, I wanted to read a book on it. <laughs> There's really no, like, <laughs> I, I went to books or like, it, it appears in little bits and pieces here and there, um, in some books, uh. Uh, there, for example, a guy named Sid Key uh, devotes a whole chapter to them, which is really cool. You don't normally get that. You just kind of get little blurbs about it or little parts and chapters about it. And um, I wanted to read a book about it, and there wasn't one. And now I don't ever want to read my book again because I've read it a trillion times. <laughs> but and that it, was it. it. It's not just, I mean, it's not an easy thing to study. The book could not have been an easy thing to research. It, it wasn't. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it it's, one of, it's one of those nine, things eight, that nine years. <laughs> I would be headbanging to do that. And yet, here's the other thing. Remember when we were in school and we'd had to study for a test and we would just cram for the test, we took the test, as soon as it was over, you forgot everything that you learned about that subject, right? But no, you, I wasn't a crammer. I studied. Okay. Well, I studied too, but there were things that I wasn't interested enough to retain. Maybe oh, that's sure, a definitely. better way to put it. Oh, yeah, that's everybody. Yeah, and so, but with this book, I mean, I I did my homework and I listened to some interviews that you did done with other people and and stuff. And you, there are people that come on sometimes as guests and they struggle if they have a book they might have forgotten some of it or whatever. But you you're just Spot on. I mean, you know this stuff, and probably because you read it a thousand times. Um, but it's it's a difficult subject, to say the least. I mean, in, in it is. it's scientific I, in I, a I way. I you're saying that because I feel like I'm stumbling over my words, actually. So. <laughs> no, you're doing just fine. I was stumbling over it as I was reading. I'm like, oh, my God, I don't want to ever be in this man's head because he's good at this stuff. I mean, you know, really good at what you were writing about. So... Just so basically, it was just you wanted to read a book about it and and you know be careful what you wish for, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, that was it. I just I I wanted to, and um, I don't know. I, I like who I, I'm trying to. I I I don't know what it was about it. I just there wasn't a book there, and I thought there should be one because it sounds like I think it's an interesting topic. You know, for any reason, somebody would find something interesting, um, especially somebody that is interested in in psychedelic history. It's just, it, it's an interesting topic. <laughs> I think it is. And, well, yeah, it is, and it's also kind of academic at the same time. You know, this isn't oh, yeah, it's, it, this it isn't is. light reading. You know, it's not something. It's not a fluffy book. Uh, <laughs> you, <laughs> so yeah, I, I champion you for even. Spending nine years writing a book, that's rather amazing, but it, it turned out very well and very interesting. So, this is good. Thank you. Um, okay, so let's get back to flying ointments for a minute. Some people may think they were just to fly, but um, people would also say that they could travel astrally, uh, they could oh, yeah. do remote viewing, they could shape shift, they could pop oh, yeah. in and out of dimensions, you know. Um, oh, yeah, or- yeah. Absolutely. That that's one of the, the the things that I was so interested to find actually in the research was so when I started the research I thought that the like an endogenic ointment and the flying ointment were one thing like uh-huh. it was just one all in, you know all encompassing ointment but no there were endogenic ointments that had nothing to do with flying at all there were flying ointments that had nothing to do with endogenic experiences and there were endogenic flying ointments and it was that last one that had entered the debate i uh, i spoke about earlier mm-hmm. at, at the um you know that was going on in the uh, the 1430s mhm yeah exactly but and also i mean they were not always taken for metaphysical or recreational purposes, but they were also used for medicinal and other beneficial purposes, weren't they? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and recreationally and sexually. Um, and uh, to 
steal from people uh, as, you know, like knockout uh, drugs. Uh, Mm -hmm. Yeah, every single one of those things falls under uh, the broad term of uh, poison magic. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, No, go ahead. Oh, what's that? I'm sorry? No, I I started to say something and you were still talking, so finish your thought. Yeah, uh, you you also have, like uh, you you said before, transformations. That can actually be broken down into two subcategories, just like the flying ointments have multiple categories, you know, whether it be entheogenic or flying or both or whatever. Um, There were, it seems anyway, that it, it... the um, there were certain kind of shamanistic transformations going on with these ointments, and it seems that there were also these totally recreational kinds of transformations going on with these ointments. Um, so you get a it, it, so much of it seems to have had to do with the person's intention and how they, I guess, focused their their spells and energies and things like that. That that really seems to have played a a large role in it. Um, I think. Uh, I think it was Hildegard of Bingen actually commented on that uh, with Mandrake, saying that um, a Mandrake works according to the person's desires. Hmm. I like that. I've always liked Mandrake anyway, but this is good. Yeah. Um, didn't they also use them in some ways for fertility? There was something mentioned about fertility as well? Oh, yeah. Um, ergot, which is the... Um, uh, the, uh, the, the, what is it? The fungus that grows on rye. That's like the base element of LSD that's mm-hmm. been used to, um, in childbirth for years as far as, you know, to, uh, help increase contractions in, in, in the, the woman that's in labor and the soon to be the mother to be, um, mm-hmm. should the child and the mother survive, <laughs> which wasn't, <laughs> you know, unfortunately it was, you know, that happened all the time. Uh, people, uh, didn't survive childhood. The mother and child wouldn't survive. Yeah. But um there were also I feel like there were some people who might have also been using them to uh worship fertility goddesses it seems. Mm-hmm. Um and it it's a shame because we don't have any of their own writings. We only have the writings of people observing them do this. Uh to go back to those early mentions uh from like Nitter and Tostado who uh, uh they the way they describe these people using them, they seem to be using them in these ritualistic fertility right ways. They seem mm-hmm. to be. Um, but again, I, it, it's so difficult to tell because we don't have the writings of the actual people themselves. Uh, and there's really no easy step from the mind of a, a theologian to the mind of a wise woman. They're just, they're, it's, it's not easy to get there. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, you're talking about the writings, the old writings and stuff. How how did you research some of that very old um, information? I mean, is there a lot of it out there? I mean, did you really have to go digging? Did you have to bribe somebody? I mean, you know, I mean, <laughs> we're talking about medieval times now. So how, yeah, where did you, you have to your- dig? And um, I, uh, so I started the research Eight so eight or nine years ago, and I'm I'm backing up. I'm trying to collect sources um, that deal with just medieval times, trial records, things like that. And it got to a point where the sources are all in Latin because that was the lingua franca of the time. That was mm-hmm. what the the, the gentry um, wrote in and uh, communicated to each other. And um, and um, so I was like, okay, well, I, I either now have to learn Latin <laughs> or I have to stop. <laughs> So one of the reasons it, it took eight, nine years is because I, I had to interrupt the process and teach myself a dead language. Wow. <laughs> and then <laughs> go again. Damn. Um, so, yes, you have to dig. Um, you have to dig deep, and it's, it's really not easy. And um, there were a lot of things that I wrote that um, m- I, I guess have upset certain people, like the whole broomstick uh you know, uh, masturbating with a broomstick thing. Um, I actually receive a lot of hate mail because of that. Oh, no. Uh, oh, yeah. But uh, no, I don't care. Um, it's fine. <laughs> They're just wrong. 
Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Well, this is my whole thing. Like, so show me, just show me one document that says that somebody ever did this. You know, like, and what I don't understand is like there, there's plenty of evidence that people just use their fingers. Like, why does it have? Like, what is this emotional attachment people have to this idea about? masturbating with hallucinogenic ointment covered brooms like it, it's it's mind-boggling mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it's the one thing that people have really like been very upset about that i'm sure your chat room is going nuts right now that I, i'm saying that nobody ever did that or at least there's zero evidence that anybody ever did that there's nothing you know what my chat room is very polite. <laughs> Nobody okay, said a word. No, and and I'm sure you know most of them are chuckling like I am at at how other people can be so so close minded and 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 whatever you know. I mean, no, I, I've got great listeners. I really do. They're not judgmental at all. And um, yeah, so no, that's not a problem. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, but and again, I would like, I would love. I went looking. Oh my god, everywhere to find one one source. For this, and uh, just <laughs> I welcome anybody to to happy hunting. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, all right. So, um, what were some of the most common herbs used in these ointments? The most common. It's again, it's difficult to say because we only have what literate people thought were in them. Um, so one of the things that, uh, for example, I didn't find a lot of mention of at all was something like cannabis, but mm -hmm. that doesn't mean at all that common people were not aware of it and didn't employ it. It doesn't mean that right. I just couldn't really write about common people using it because the gentry didn't write about it. Uh, what they did write about were things like, um, opium, mandrake, henbane, uh, belladonna, and um, Dach Dachura later on, um, ergot uh, comes up, um, toad poison comes up. Um, but most of the time, um, the, in at least the trial records, the, the inquisitors and the scribes, they didn't care what kind of, the, the drugs were beside the point. It wasn't, it wasn't like, like uh, Jonathan Ott had called it the pharmacratic inquisition it wasn't that at all. It was it was a condemnation of a specific kind of use, which was mm -hmm. the entheogenic flying kind. Other than that, it, people wrote about using these things. Uh, the alchemist uh, Heinrich Cornelius von Nettesheim uh, oh. wrote openly that he inhaled these substances for its their visionary. Uh, qualities. Um, uh, Albert Magnus wrote openly that necromancers used henbane uh, to conjure spirits. I mean, it, that was, it, it wasn't, it wasn't the drugs themselves that were condemned yet. It, it was a specific use because mm -hmm. people that would enter these kinds of trance states, uh, like mm -hmm. take, for example, the Benendanti and the Frioli in Italy, they, mm -hmm. they didn't need these ointments at all. They were not required at all. They had been raised, culturally programmed their whole lives to believe that it was their duty to fall into a trance on appointed days and times to battle witches for the good of the crops. And they didn't mm -hmm. require anointment at all. But yet that still practice of falling into a trance was still demonized. Mm -hmm. Like any chance they could take, any chance they would do, do you, you know... I mean, it was just, by that time, it was, okay, let's get these witches. Let's get these witches. And they would, you know, pick up anything they can. Um, now, in modern times, like now, um, are they, do you know, and, and let's let people understand that if they get your book, you don't have a whole bunch of recipes in there. Um, you don't have, you know, here, this is how you do this and this and this and this. We, we, you talk about it, but it's not necessarily going to be a book that somebody that wants to um, make these potions would be able to, in a sense? Um, in some senses, yes, and in some senses, no. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, a lot of them, most of them, are translated from medical texts, uh -huh. and medical texts were very kind of bare bones at the time <laughs> especially the ones that were uh that were written for lay healers um very bare bones so they'll just they'll just say like make an ointment of 
you know, opium and henbane and egg and menstrual blood. And that's mm-hmm. it. <laughs> and that's the, yeah. you know, that's the that that's the recipe. It's, just, it's not three you know, di- drops of this and a pinch of that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, and now, on the other hand, there are other recipes that are very, very, very detailed uh, on how they should be made. Um, but um, I, I think I'm supposed to say, as a disclaimer, I do not uh, condone anybody using <laughs> any drugs at all. It'll lead you to become queer. And you'll worship the devil, and uh, that's that's what drugs do. Yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, you have to have those disclaimers in there. Um, so, all right. Um, I was talking about modern times. Uh, do you think people are still using these ointments for the same purposes as in days gone by? Or maybe have they been made redundant by pharmaceuticals and chemical potions rather than botanical ones? Um, I, I definitely know some people that still use these in more kind of traditional ways. Um, so I, I guess that would be my, I, I would imagine there are, I think they're in, in Europe. Some people still do that. I know somebody wrote a pan. and I feel bad. I can't, uh, I don't remember the, what it was, but somebody did some research on that, and apparently there are still some people, like there is survival of it in, I think, southern Italy, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. Um, in modern time, yeah, I, I mean, people, uh, so, I mean, people still go to different, like, gatherings and things like that and take these substances and dance around fires and things like that, so I, I think mm-hmm. there's still a tradition, I think people are still doing it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, Hell, I, I, do it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I can't see that certain things just go away like that and don't happen. Yeah. Um, you know, it, kids it's, don't do whatever. Yeah, kids don't do it. Um, it's just I, I got a giggle <clears throat> when you were talking about. I'm probably not going to say it right. Matusha de Francesca making ointments that wives could use on their abusive husbands, as you mentioned earlier. Um, mm-hmm. Who was she? And and I kind of like her style. <laughs> yeah, Matucha de Francesca was uh, a very famous uh, sorceress. Earlier before Marla, you were saying how um, these wise women were at one time revered in their societies. Mm-hmm. Matucha w- is a perfect example of that person that was revered, and then through the instigation of a traveling preacher named um, Fire Bernardino, uh was kind of um, demonized as a as a witch uh, by the very neighbors that once sought her services uh, because yeah. th- this guy would go around giving these speeches saying that, you know, you all think this is harmless stuff, but these people are really working with demons. They're not working with, like, you know, the church or us. Like, you got to come to us, right, for salvation and health, healing, all those things. Um but before that time, and it's weird because depending on where you were in Italy and at what point in time, you were either tolerated as a wise woman or a, or a medicine man or not. Um, mm-hmm. So, like, for example, in, um, let's say, Matucha lived in Italy in the early 1400s. If she had been living in England... She would have never gotten through the door as far as um, using, uh, you know, being a wise woman. She would have been shut down immediately. But in mm-hmm. Italy, she was totally tolerated until mm-hmm. it was, you know, uh, people were convinced that she was evil by uh, a real, you know, sumnabitch. So mm-hmm. um, she is, uh, she's a perfect example of that transition of the wise woman into the witch. Uh, mm-hmm. You could see it in her in the write up of her of her trial record. Um, when when you look at it and read, I mean, you you can see it. There's a and there's and people can read it. There's a great English translation um, that's available in a there's, it's a collection, an anthology. It's just called I think Medieval Source Book. Uh, no, that's the that's that online uh, digital archive. Uh, I cited in my book. I don't remember the other title um, mm-hmm. at this moment. Oh, no, uh, Medieval Italy Text and Translation. Uh, so there are English translations available, and I, uh, anybody could read it and see for themselves, like, wow, you know, you can watch the stereotype be foisted upon her, you know, mm-hmm. in this record itself. 
Yeah, and she, I mean, she was just one of many. I mean, maybe she stood out for certain reasons, but... Um, well, she was famous. Yeah, I mean, These she... These were all the people that were tolerated in their society. When a traveling preacher came through and convinced you that this person was actually, you know, like a whore of Satan, well, you knew exactly who to point the finger at, at the wise woman that, that you know, <laughs> was your neighbor or lived in the next village over. Mm-hmm. They were well known for their for their arts and for what they did and the services they provided. Yeah, um, I've got a question from the chat room. Um, she's asking, "How did the Catholic Church have an effect in Italy?" How did the Catholic Church have an effect in Italy? Yeah, I guess maybe in regards to and Cat, if you can explain that a little bit more. But yeah, I'm, I'm mind, guessing. I'm not, yeah. Yeah, if, I mean, I'm, if she can maybe narrow that, that's a. Uh, it's a generic question in a sense, yeah. Well, uh, I mean, you, you in, in the broad senses, you 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 have a, um, you know, a a, a a sort of early modern Christian Roman Empire. I mean. All right, she just said in terms of the wise women, and I think. Um, I think that's just as far as helping knock them down, knock them out of the ballpark, I guess. Oh, oh, okay, okay. Um, oh, that, that, okay, I, that's a great question. So there was a, um, it had been determined in the early 1400s that all magic, all kinds of it, um, was the, could be directly linked to devil worship, all of it. And what happened was you had these different preachers taking that idea, like Bernardino of Siena, um, out into the world. Uh, these guys, these traveling preachers, were the newscasters of the day. So if you have a Catholic newscaster, which many of them were, you know, kind of think about, think, uh, imagine their, think of Bernardino of Siena as Bill O'Reilly, in a sense. A a very religiously conservative individual spreading the news, only there is no counterbalance, and most people believe everything this guy says because they have no other option but to believe him. Mm-hmm. Um, I, does that answer her question? It, it's they, they just uh-huh. they they went out and just spread the word that these kinds of people, because they were using magic, could only be invoking the devil to do it. Mm-hmm. And, and I mean that that went across the board throughout Europe, throughout just about everywhere else. That using magic is evil, and and it's all it all has to do with Satan. It all has to do with the devil. And I mean, in in today's society, go to Saudi Arabia and say you're a witch. See what happens. You know, there are countries in Africa. In, <laughs> yeah, they, you know, the, in this day and age, witches are still being killed. For being witches, and it, why? Because it's bad, it's demonic, and or whatever, you know, whatever devil they pray to, in a sense. So, it's not uncommon, but it's just um, back then. I mean, it's a little bit better now. I mean, at least you know, not, it, we're not getting persecuted everywhere, just in a few places. But back then, everybody did because it was just you know a really, really bad thing to do, and. That was tough. So, yeah, I mean, it just happened. <laughs> and, and it's a shame. Um, yeah. w- okay, so what about Finicella, who, and I probably didn't probably Finichella. pronounce that right, yeah. who used drug ointments to imagine herself transformed into a cat? I like yes. that. Yes. Uh, I want to Finichella- hear about that. Yeah, she lived in Rome. I actually, uh, it's funny, I, I just did. Um, an interview on on Gaim TV, and I totally spaced on Finicella's name, and uh, mm-hmm. I called her Peretti, who was a, a licensed midwife that lived around the same time. And uh, so I'm going to try to get it right this time. <laughs> Finicella <laughs> uh, was a um, she appears to have been a kind of pediatrician who used um, uh, called upon local spirits uh, to help heal children, um, but again. It, People died all the time back then, and um, you know, taking uh, a parent taking frustrations out on 
a um, you know the, over the death of a child on on a woman like Fina Chell, you know that that was going to happen. Uh, so even without a you know a, a preacher coming and saying, "Hey, this is what's going on." Uh, these people are really witches. You still might have just somebody accusing this person of using magic in a you know in a malefic way, not so much a mm-hmm. demonic way. Um, mm-hmm. But Finicello was also um, the result. She's another one that um, Bernardino of Siena stopped through Rome, <laughs> gave her his sermon about how these uh, people are are really evil, and you know everybody knew to point the finger at Finicello. Uh, she, um, one of the, the reason his record is also important is that his, uh, his mention that she used the ointment to turn herself into a cat, uh, is very off the cuff. Uh, he doesn't, um, equate it with anything evil. He just kind of mentions it. And he also says that the ointment caused her to imagine it, meaning she was hallucinating. Mm-hmm. And that's a pretty, uh, for a historian, that's a really good account because Bernardino was the kind of guy that really loved to embellish stories. I mean, I've read a lot of his sermons. I mean, he loved to embellish. And had he, had she not been using the ointment for this reason, he would have just said, oh, yeah, she really turned into a cat. But <laughs> instead, he mocks her. And says she's in it, like she's under the delusion of this ointment. She thinks she's turned into a cat, but it's not. It's just this ointment. Like, what a fool. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? Like, because yeah. there wasn't yet this evil stereotype about these kinds of ointments yet. Mm-hmm. So it was, um, and she wasn't even condemned for using that. She was condemned uh, for uh, infanticide. Uh, that's why, you know, Bernardino was saying, oh, if your child died, it's because she enchanted, you know, she invoked a demon and the demon killed your kid. So that's mm-hmm. why she was killed. So the whole point that he mentions the ointment, like, is just, uh, it's valuable for its its nonchalance. Like, he didn't even, it, it was, she was going to die whether he mentioned that ointment or not, you know, and, and there mm-hmm. it is. And it, it has nothing to do with flying to the devil. And he he very much alludes to the fact that this is causing her to hallucinate. Yeah, which, yeah, then, as you said, people would jump just on the opposite. You know, oh, it did make her hallucinate. Oh, my God. And, you know, she she now has eight lives left because we just killed her yesterday. Yeah. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. And, uh, uh, further on that, uh, there was another case of uh, uh, there were three girls in a, uh, that were in a, a strawberry patch that ate a, um, they shared a, a, a piece of bread that had been dosed with probably ergot, but we don't know. Um, mm-hmm. But one of them had a really, I mean, like they, their whole thing was they were going to turn into cows and fly away. And it is one of the cases I write about in the book. They were going to fly to a witch dance. And it, it was totally for like this recreational thing that they wanted to do this. But one of the girls ended up having what we would call a bummer or a bad trip. The authorities got involved, and nobody uh, that participated in this was executed except for the girl that supplied the bread. She was executed for a malefic form of venificium or poison magic, whereas the other girls were not because they had just engaged in poison magic, and one of them was, you know, uh, you know, uh, I guess had w- was harmed by it. So. It's cases are, you know, they're all over the place. It's very, it's very hard to maintain a stereotype. And that's why they invented the witch stereotype because there were so many different <laughs> things going on. Yeah. And that's maybe where they invented the cow that jumped over the moon, right? I, I it's now. possible. I don't know. <laughs> I, I didn't consider that, you though. Just I don't never know. know. It's possible. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I could just uh, we have we have a person in the chat room. Her name is Moof, and Moof. her avatar is a cow. And so, you know, we always talk about cows and, you know, stuff. So she just went, cows, yes. So we're talking about, we're talking about some relatives move long, you know, not blood relatives, but all right. Anyway, um, <laughs> so, so um, you have, obviously, when, when one does research on a book, one, like, it, like I wrote a cookbook once, I did, and there were 200 recipes and I had to try them all. Because I had to make sure they worked, you know, or they, you know, weren't going to give anybody ptomaine poisoning. So I'm, I'm assuming that you had to do the same with some of the things that you put in your book. So have you actually tr- 
tried any of these potions to see how effective they were, just like Matusha? Uh, so here's, here's the interesting <laughs> thing about that. Mm-hmm. When, when and if I say that I have, then the academic community is going to say, well, your work is baseless now because you're okay. just writing in your experiences into this. If I say that I haven't, then others, like, for example, your audience, are going to make the same argument. Yeah, so you're kind of between the rock and the hard place here. Okay. I'm between the devil and the deep blue sea with it, um, and that's about all I'm going to say about it. No, that's fine. (laughs) Um, And, you know, when you were mentioning um, the... I forget what it's called, the the fungus that grows on bread, that was partly to blame for the Salem witch trials, they think, or the rye went bad. Um, uh, yeah, that's that's been that's been talked about. Kinda, it, it was an idea, but it, it's it's been debunked now for a oh, little okay. bit. Yeah, it it was there. There was really no one part. Actually, I have the book somewhere here. Um, Somebody had theorized it. Oh, here it is. Poisons of the Past by um, Mary Kilborn Matassian. Matassian, uh, oh. if, you're, if your listeners are interested. Uh, she had theorized it, and uh, some other people had as well. And it, it wasn't a bad theory. And um, uh, it just, there, there, there were some better explanations than that. I mean, it's, mm-hmm. of course, it's still technically possible that that played a role. But it mm-hmm. seems to have more been just um, some very... Um, uh, oppressed young girls seeking yeah. attention uh, yeah. in a very highly patriarchal society, uh, and so much so that people died for it. Yeah, and and that's kind of what they said. I, I think maybe they were looking for another out, and you know, not blaming people, but blaming nature. You know, something went bad, and people got poisoned, and this is why we hung all those innocent people, kind of thing. Well. Right? well it's it's a little more pedantic. That what they did was they blamed uh, the slave woman, uh, Tichuba. Yeah, Tichuba. The, you know, yes. that's that's what they did. Well, that uh, too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the whole thing was just very, very sad. And, yeah, it, um, it 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 is sad, and and that's one of the things. I mean, a lot of these records, um, you know, you're 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 translating them at a snail's pace because you just recently taught yourself a language, and. <laughs> It's kind of it it get it got very sad at times, just like mm-hmm. this slow unraveling of what these people experienced in in torture rooms and and the way they were uh, i don't know just just made to say things that they knew they had never done and that weren't true and um mm-hmm. I mean, there there were records that I mean were heartbreaking, like people like crying out as they were burned being burned that they only confessed because they were told by the Inquisitor that if they did, they would be set free. So they were just completely mm-hmm. duped. And um, yeah. I don't know, it was really sad. <laughs> like, it was it was heartbreaking at times. The burning times were horrible. I mean, it, and, and, you know, like in Salem, everybody that died in Salem was not, um, were not witches. I mean, they yeah, were they just... Were and and probably across the board, well, I can't say everybody because they had to have been a few witches here and there, but, you know, it was just, um, it was well, fear. It was fear of, every, I mean, if you, this this was the thing that got me in the mal- malleus. They were talking about, um, they would have someone in jail on suspicion of being a witch. Now, the jails, we know, were dirty you know, filled with hay and outside and the elements and everything. And if something like a beetle or a spider happened to walk into that cell, mm-hmm. this, this person was automatically banned a witch, I mean, branded a witch, and would die because, oh, well, that's, you know, that's, well, it that's wasn't a beetle. spider. That wasn't mm-hmm. a beetle. That was the devil. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And so th- it, it's like this mass hysteria that, hits everybody and there's a thousand different reasons for it but basically it's fear and ignorance but I think anybody that knows the story of the burning times and knows the the decline of the wise woman into now so many still fly under the radar for fear of prosecution even verbal prosecution 
um, people can't be who they are, they can't come out because of all of this. Um, it's really, it's a shame, and that's putting it very mildly, and it's something that happened so well that I don't know that it could ever be turned around back again. I, I don't think witches will ever be wise women, because now, basically, in in certain terms, you know, pointed hats, warts, green complexion, you know, all of those things. People don't realize that we've learned how to cover that up, right? Um, and so, you know, it's like the, the Raul Duhl movie, The Witches, you know, I mean, pull off the thing and you got scabby heads and, you know, really, we don't all have club feet, by the way. Um, yeah, so, well, you know, it happens, <laughs> but we just don't spread it around. <laughs> Those prosthetic shoes that make a difference. Um, but, you know, just for, for whatever it was, you know, all you had to do is have a birthmark. You were a witch. All you had to do is have some kind of a, a physical problem, like a twitch in your eye or something or a stutter. And, you know, I mean, there was just no way around it. it or nothing there at all, because that was just that, that sneaky old devil <laughs> is hiding something, you know? Well, that's true. And somebody in the chat room just said that they would sometimes mistake mental illnesses for somebody being a witch. Oh, so, yeah, yeah. Some, most yeah. of the time. It, again, it was, a ver- it was very easy to point your finger at a, a person with mental illness and say, yeah, look, the devil got into this person and, and now they're yeah. crazy. Yeah, exactly. So the basic bottom line here is that back in the 60s when the drug culture was flourishing and people were experimenting with LSD and magic mushrooms and all other forms of botanical hallucinogens, they were pretty much mistaken when they thought they were the first to discover these magical wonders, huh? Um, I don't know that they all thought that they were the first. Um, maybe some of them did, but uh, I mean, there's the, the thing is before the 1960s, you, you could study this stuff at, at, you know, any college, like at a, at a top university. I mean, you, you, the, these, one of the things that I'm trying to do is get these studies back into the university, like by, you know, trying to, um, you know, set a new paradigm for research into, um, psychedelic psychedelia. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as to use more uh, rigorous and historical standards than just kind of willy nillying you know psychedelic history, which happens a lot um, mm-hmm. so uh but yeah you it, it you used to be able to uh to study this stuff and it 's a shame that uh that you know, i mean in a few places you still can uh but in most places you can't that 's weird because you would think that we were a lot more enlightened now. And more accepting of things in general, so I don't know, you know. Well, it, it put a really the the nineteen sixties unfortunately put a really <laughs> bad taste in mm-hmm. people's mouths, and um, and it's it's unfortunate. Uh, you had yeah. some people that um, were genuine uh, spiritual seekers, and you had other people that were absolute charlatans, mm-hmm. and. The news media, being what it is, is always going to focus on the charlatan. Um, I think there, there's a Bill Hicks uh, line about that, where the, why is the news story always, you know, kid takes LSD, jumps out a window? Why is it never kid takes LSD, discovers, you know, the secrets of the universe that time, you know, we are all one and yada? I can't, I don't remember the whole thing, but uh, you know, yeah. it, it's the negative that's going to sell. So that yeah, that's what exactly. was pushed at the tail end of the 1960s. Uh, and unfortunately, that is the view that most people have today. And, and when, you, you know, when somebody like me says, oh, no, the, these substances have been used in different places and times for religious reasons, uh, I mean, that's the other side. I get hate mail for that, too. <laughs> mm-hmm. So the, uh, the, the super conservatives and the super liberals never really like the, uh, the person uh, taking the middle position. There you go. And it's hard. But it's, it's okay. Hard it's to the be honest the- position. So. <laughs> it's true. It is. So, you know, speaking of not being able to learn about this, we're going back to your book because we've just got a couple of minutes left. Where can people find your book? Um, Barnes & Noble has it. Um, smaller bookshops, uh, for example, like uh, Changing Hands in Arizona has it. Powell Books up here in uh, Portland has it. Um, Amazon.com, Powell's.com, uh, BarnesandNoble.com. Uh, it's out there. 
It's all over the place, yeah. And where can exactly. people, do you have a website that people can find out you, find out I you, do. find out more about you? I do. Um, it's arspsychedelia.com. That's A-R-S-P-S-Y-C-H-E-D-E-L-I-A.com. And uh, there's also a Facebook page uh, for the book, The Witch's Ointment. If you just you know go to Facebook and type in The Witch's Ointment, it'll come right up. Perfect. Well, I really want to thank you for popping in, and I'm glad we finally hooked up. And and yeah. because it's it's an interesting subject, and you know, it's not the same cookie cutter thing that most people hear about all the time. And I think it's important to get the word out. And you know, learning is important, and it may be to some, and some may not. But still, um, it was really interesting. I enjoyed the book, and um, like I said, I really want to thank you for popping in. Well, thank you so much for having me, Marl. This was a lot of fun. It is, and and we'll maybe do it again. Find something, it. take it, and run with it. Very yeah, good. I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> stumble over my words next time. Oh, please, no, because I don't want to be the only one stumbling. You know, I oh, mean, okay, so it, we'll 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 just do that together. It'll it'll balance itself out then. Exactly. You know, I'm not. not the, <laughs> I trip over my tongue. Somebody should be there to pick it up because then I don't look so bad. All right. <laughs> this is you grab me as I'm falling and trying to pick you up. <laughs> we can do it. We can do it. Sounds good. Well, I also want to thank everybody for joining us tonight that's sitting in the chat room and listening and listening on the podcast as this is playing. Um, and until next time, everybody, blessed be and marry meet again. Good night. This Metal. has been another edition of Stirring the Cauldron with Marla Brooks. Be sure to tune in next week at the same time for another great guest and more cauldron stirring. Any rebroadcast or other use of this program without explicit permission is strictly prohibited. Copyright 2014. Moonlight Hall by Kevin McLeod. Licensed through Incompetech.com.